I've been reading through the book of Proverbs this month. I know some of the other guys have been reading through it here. And it's just, it's just amazing to see the wisdom that's flowing from these pages, right? If someone told you, I'm going to give you the steps to be a successful person. Here are all the steps. And I've proven that I've practiced them and I'm successful. Wouldn't you want to follow? Wouldn't you want to learn? Wouldn't you want to go and try and understand what these steps are that this guy's talking about? And really, that's what we have in the, in the book of Proverbs. We have King Solomon, a person who has ex experienced extraordinary success in many different ways, uh, be it in you know, power, status, po politics, but also in, you know, in, in business and in projects. And he's grown to be this hugely wealthy person in the Bible. Not a perfect person. He made mistakes. But so much wisdom that we can learn from, from the book of Proverbs. And so today, I really hope that we can learn something from the book of Proverbs which has to do with how we build fruitful friendships. So that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today. When we, before we start, let me ask you guys, what are some qualities that you would say you, you appreciate in a good friend? You can just shout out. What are some qualities that, that you appreciate in a good friend? What's that? Feeding me, Feeding me. <laughs> feed me. <laughs> The way to Jame's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> Honesty. Honesty. Yeah, very true. Honesty. Listening ear. A listening ear, a good listener is a good friend. Consistent. Consistent in what? In everything. <laughs> yes, I was okay. going to say that too. Consistent. So someone who's consistent, that's very true. Anything else that I miss, we're missing? Savage. Savage. <laughs> a good friend is savage because Sammy needs that in his life. Um, anyone else? Loyal. 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 These are great qualities. Is it easy to find a good friend? Is it easy to be a good friend? It's not, right? We had a gem talk on Wednesday, which uh, Vincent was uh, helping to MC and lead and did a great job. And uh, one of the survey questions was this, how do you feel when people ask you about your personal life? I thought it was really interesting that more than a third of people responding said they actually feel really uncomfortable when people ask about your personal life. It feels so capo because the gem talk was about capo do's and don'ts, how to be capo in the right way. Um, but it's interesting, right? And it's, it's maybe not so surprising because for so many people, myself included, it's not always comfortable when people start asking really personal things about your life. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not... It's not easy, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily look forward to people getting into our personal lives. And the next question that was asked in this survey was, who do you usually feel most comfortable sharing something personal with? And the most of the respondents were not family, not even your spouse or family, right? Sorry, married couples. Uh, but it was your best friend. Now, hopefully your spouse can be your best friend. Amen, right? Um, but, but somehow we feel most safe, we feel most comfortable to open up with the person that we trust the most, that we feel least judgment from, that we feel will accept us, uh, which your best friend, right? Like the qualities you guys mentioned is consistent, is loyal, is honest, is not going to leave you and not going to make you feel judged. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting that because I, I'm sure that many of the people who responded in the first question and said that they don't feel comfortable when someone asks them a personal question, were also the people that chose best friend as the person they feel most comfortable sharing with. Which means that maybe even our best friends, we don't always feel comfortable letting them into our personal life. You know, and I think moving to, um, to Asia, you know, culture is a bit different because I think people have many, many friends, many acquaintances. There's so many groups of you know, friendship groups, right, in, in Indo. So many acquaintances, but how many of those acquaintances does one really let into one's life, right? Of all those acquaintances, how many of them could you really say, this person truly knows me? This person has truly come into my deeper parts of my heart. Um, it's rare, it's so rare in the world because friendship in the world is not really those things, right? Friendship in the world is usually, we have something in common, we hang out, we spend time, we, we, we have a hobby, and that's great. Those kind of friendships I love too. But there's something about fruitful friendships in the Bible 
that God is trying to teach us. That's more than just having something in common to talk about. But it's really about a level of calling one another higher. About being vulnerable, allowing someone in, allowing someone to help shape you and to help you to grow in the things that actually you would otherwise maybe find it really hard to accept. So friendships can truly sharpen us, especially when we need it most. We need to be sharpened in life. God knows that we need to be sharpened. I was looking at what the sharpest knives in the world are. And um, I was doing some research on Japanese knives because Japanese knives tend to be the sharpest knives in the world. And I was looking at the method that they, the way that they make these is, is amazing. That the, the real craftsmen of Japanese knives, they are so proud of their craft, like many you know, Japanese craftsmen are. Um, and I was listening to an interview with one Japanese knife maker. And he was saying, our knives are such high quality and so sharp that, peop that people still bring me knives today to be sharpened that my grandfather made. Right? So generations ago, people still bringing the knives to sharpen them in his, in his place. Which you might be thinking, that's probably not a great business model because I think his knives are a little bit too high quality. Um, but, but I was thinking, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that amazing? They go through a hundred steps of production and he said there's three things that make a very high quality knife. One is the type of steel that goes into it. It has to be this particular really high quality um, heat treated steel. The second is the hammering process. So it gets hammered, I don't know how many thousands of times. That's why the really good Japanese knives have those kind of like hammer, you know, hammer marks on them. And the second thing is the process of grinding and sharpening. If any of those, one th of those three steps is compromised, the knife is not gonna be sharp for long. The knife is not gonna be a high quality knife. But even the sharpest knives in the world, they still need sharpening eventually. The sharpest knives of the highest quality knives in the world still need sharpening. God knows that at a certain point, we will eventually go dull. We will get blunt. We need to be sharpened. There's going to be times where we get discouraged or we face challenging things, or we just reach a point in our spiritual life where we feel burnt out. We feel demotivated to seek God. Reading the Bible just feels like a chore. Coming to church feels like a chore. There's going to be times where where we get to that place where we're just not sharp. We're just not performing the function that we were intended to do, right? And it's at those times that it's not always easy to reach out and seek help, right? Because when you're feeling demotivated, you're feeling discouraged, that's probably the hardest time for you to seek guidance and seek mentorship. But that's where a friendship, a real friend, a true friend can come in. Because a true friend knows when someone is getting dull and a true friend doesn't you know it, it, it's not hard to reach out when you're when you have that kind of connection you can avoid a pastor you can avoid a counselor but avoiding your friends is hard even in your marriage if your spouse is your best friend you can't avoid that there's no way you can turn if you have a marriage where you sharpen one another as spiritual friends that's God's intention that's God's purpose to keep you where you need to be on the edge so we need these kind of friendships in our life. Uh, I wanted to share some quotes about friendship that I like. Here are some of my favorite, a couple of my favorite quotes on friendship. A friend doubles your joys and halves your sorrows. When you have a real friend, they can, they lift you up. They, they, your, your joys are doubled, but also your sorrows are halved. And I like this quote by C.S. Lewis. It says, friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of life. If I had to give a piece of advice to a young man about a place to live, I think I should say sacrifice almost everything to live where you can be near your friends. Amen. It's amazing when you, can, when you can have those kind of friendships. You live close by, you can connect. Grateful that I live next to Calvin Olive now as well. You know, some friends in the neighborhood as well as other friends around me. Um, but it's, it's, it's amazing when you have friendships and you live close by. Proverbs, let's jump into to what God's wisdom through the book of Proverbs, through Solomon. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. This idea of a friend being there throughout your life, whereas your own sibling may only be there in your time of adversity, but a friend will be there at all times. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I love that. 
Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Better to be rebuke someone openly than to show hidden love for someone. You know your real friends because they really dare to tell you the things that other people won't. Your real friends dare to tell you the things that, that, that you need to grow in. And finally, our, our theme verse, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so today I, I just want us to, to see the need for relationships in our life that keep us faithful. We need those kind of friendships. We need friendships that help keep us faithful in our lives. Friendships that, that, that are there to spur us on. Right? And chances are you've never had this kind of friendship outside of church. It's, it's rare. It's that rare that I know for me, I've never had a, a friendship where someone cared about me being faithful. Faithful to God, faithful in my marriage, faithful to my children. Right? Faithfulness, this quality of faithfulness that seems to be so rare today in this world where we have a divorce rate of 50-60% now. Faithfulness is not something that's easy, it seems, to grasp in the world, right? We need friendships that can help us to be faithful. What about in the Bible? What about examples of, of biblical relationships, biblical friendships that sharpened each other? Um, if we go all the way back, we can see throughout the Bible there are relationships where people sharpened each other. Lot had Abraham. Right? Lot was Abraham's nephew. Moses had Jethro, and he also had the elders of Israel that supported him. Joshua had Moses. Elisha had Elijah. David had Nathan. And we go into the New Testament. You know, Mary had Elizabeth. The disciples had Jesus. The apostle Paul had Barnabas and Ananias. Timothy and Titus, they had Paul. These were examples of of relationships that, that, that were sharpening each other, that were helping each other, that were encouraging each other to be faithful to God. We cannot be islands in our spiritual walk. We cannot be, we cannot be lone rangers in, in our Christian faith. It doesn't work like that. It, there's so few examples in the Bible, if any, of someone who was a complete lone ranger who accomplished something amazing for God. Right? There's, there's just so few examples of that in the Bible of, of, of people that were complete islands who were able to accomplish amazing things for God, that were able to stay faithful to God in the long run. We cannot be that way. We have to invite people to keep us faithful in our lives. Um, so who is sharpening you today? Who is it that's sharpening you? You know, it's easy to feel that we're mature enough, we, we're stable enough, we're you know, competent enough to be able to manage things ourselves. But that's not what God is telling us. Even the sharpest pencils go blunt, even the sharpest knives go dull. You will not become the person that God wants you to become without someone sharpening you, without a mentor, without a discipler, without a coach. You can call it what you want, but you will not become that person that God believes you can be, everything you can be, if you don't have a coach in your life, if you don't have a mentor in your life. The greatest basketball player of all time, Michael um, Jordan. I was about to say Michael Jackson. He was not the best basketball player of all time. Michael Jordan, he had Phil Jackson. That's why I was about to say Michael Jackson because his coach's name was Phil Jackson. One of the amazing uh, best coaches in the NBA. Without Phil Jackson, would we have the Michael Jordan that we all know? Possibly not. Paul McCartney had John Lennon and John Lennon had Paul McCartney. Would we have the Paul McCartney today without the John Lennon and vice versa? I highly doubt it. All of the greats had coaches. Uh, Bill Gates has Warren Buffett right, as a mentor too. Uh, would we have the Bill Gates we have today without Warren Buffett? Maybe, I don't know. right? But, but even the greats have coaches, mentors, disciples, counselors. Um, sometimes we have, a, we have a mentality where if I need help, that means there's something wrong. If I need a mentor, that means there's something wrong with me. But actually, that's, that's not the case, right? We need someone to sharpen us. Sometimes we do need correction. Sometimes there are things that are wrong with us. But we need someone to help us to be everything we can be for God. 
right? So I want us to think about that in your life. There are three um, major sources of learning that I feel teach us, that are the best teachers in our life. Uh, one of the most powerful teachers can be actually just learning from our experience and our mistakes, right? That's one way to learn. That's a powerful way to learn. We learn from our experience, we learn from our failures. And failure is a great teacher. There's no doubt about it, right? Winston Churchill said this, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts, right? Failure is not something that's fatal. It doesn't define you, but it's about being able to, to continue. That's what matters is what Churchill says. Einstein said, a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new. Right, that's what Einstein says. You know, the book of Proverbs so many times calls us to be wise and to actually learn from our mistakes. So learning from our mistakes is a great thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think here's a more powerful way to learn is to learn from others' mistakes and others' experience. Why is that? Because failure can take an emotional toll. Failure can take a spiritual toll on you. Failure takes a lot of time and resources too, right? Failure is a powerful teacher, don't get me wrong, but it will also take a lot from you. You have to go through the route and learn yourself in order to fail, and there's a lot of pride and stubbornness on that route too, right? A greater way to learn, I believe, is to learn from, the, from others' experience and others' mistakes and be able to, to take meaningful lessons from what they share, you know? God doesn't want us to, to just pursue relationships for the sake of failure so we can learn what we need, right? Who wants to do that? I want to go and get in relationships so I can fail and figure out what I really need, right? There's a better way to learn than that. God doesn't want us to pursue a business that we think is going to fail just so we can learn what it means to, to fail so we can be successful. I mean, people do that, but God is not necessarily saying we should do that in order to learn. There's other ways we can learn. We're so great, we're so lucky in the church to have so many mature, wise people. The Omtantas in church, for one, we have um, you know, people that have been through a lot of failure and a lot of mistakes in their life, be it in relationships, be it in business, be it in just, you know, in their families. And there's so much that I personally have learned from their lives. When I spend time with the kind of the older Omtantas, there's, there's a lot that I learned from them. But even in Jem, there's people that have matured and have experienced a lot and have grown so much that even in Jem we have our very own Omtantas now that can, that can, that can share their lives and can actually raise, raise up a lot of young people too. So that's one way we can learn. Finally, learning from God's wisdom in the Bible. Right? Learning from the Bible is actually the ultimate source of, of learning um, because that's truth. That one we, we know and we can trust. We just need to learn how to apply it. Right? So learning from God's wisdom in the Bible, we can actually apply principles that we learn from the book of Proverbs. But just reading it is not going to make you wise. Right? If I just read the book of Proverbs, I don't suddenly become wise. I have to be able to filter it into my life. And when I couple that with learning from other people's experience and their mistakes, as well as seeking you know, mentorship, as well as learning from my own experience, that's a really powerful way, I think, to grow in your wisdom. So I want to just talk about a couple things now. One is about how to be a good enough mentee. So I want to talk about two things. One is how to be a good enough mentee, so someone who's being mentored, right? And then the second part is I want to talk about how to be a good enough mentor. Good enough because you can't be perfect. And perfection is, can, be, is, can be distracting too. So how to be good enough at being a mentee. These are some principles that I want to talk about. Define your what and your why. Right. Mentorship works best when you know what you need to grow in. What are the areas that you feel you need to grow in? For example, I need to grow in, in my relationship with God, quite simple one. Right? Or I need to grow in my marriage. Or I need to grow in, in learning what a spiritual relationship looks like. Or I just want to grow in, in being fruitful as a Christian. And so you identify what are the areas that you need to grow in. And then you ask yourself, why is this important to me? What difference will this make in my life? Why is this something that I need to grow in? And now some of, some of those answers to those questions will not just come yourself. You need to actually ask people, what do you think I need to grow in? Because we have blind spots too, right? There are areas that we just can't see that we don't know we need to grow in. And it's only when we get into a community and spend time with people that we figure these things out. 
So ask people if you're not sure, what do you think I need to grow in? Why, and, and the why will come when you hear people sharing. Why was it important for them to grow in their marriage? What difference did it make in their life? What difference did it make to their, their relationship with their children? What difference did it make in their work when they, when they became a disciple and started practicing biblical principles in their business? You know, the why is really important. Second is define your who and your when. Now in church, we have, we have kind of like discipling mentor relationships, right? And so those are there to be you know, your guide, your primary guide, your primary source of kind of uh, mentorship. But it's not limited to that, right? In fact, if you see someone who you feel is excelling in a particular area of their life in the church and you feel like they're spiritual, they're growing, and that's an area that I feel I need to grow in, then that's someone you can ask, right? To learn from them and define the when. You know, don't ask someone, can I meet you every day for, for a month? Because that's probably not realistic for someone, particularly if you have kids in a family, right? But, but hey, can, can we set a time? Like, can I meet you just once every two weeks for the next six months? Or even once a month if that's too much for you. I just want to get time with you once a month. We'll spend time. And I want to talk about these areas that I've identified in my life that I need to grow in. What do you think about that? Wow. That makes someone prepared. Okay, all right, this person's intentional. This person has a, has a goal to grow in these areas. Um, have a learner's heart. Listen and take note and discuss. You really need to, when you spend time with someone, be intentional to learn. Take note. Own the agenda when you're spending time with someone. Ask questions. Own the agenda. Be intentional when you're going in there. Maybe you're going to hear things as the relationship goes on that are not easy to accept. But have a learner's heart. Be humble. What will be your response when someone shares something with you that you feel you need to grow in? That it's not easy. Right? Will you turn around and, and resent the person? Will you start questioning their motives? Oh, why is he saying this to me? He must have an agenda, right? But how you're the one asking help from the person, right? Be humble. Try to clarify before you start judging someone based on what they're saying, right? Clarify, what do you mean by that? I can't see that yet in my life. Can you help me to see why you would say that? Um, let's not be mistrusting. Let's have a learner's heart. And finally, oh yeah, Proverbs 15 says this, one who neglects discipline rejects himself, but one who listens to a rebuke acquires understanding. If we are rejecting people's discipline or rebukes, we're actually rejecting ourselves. We're actually rejecting the process that God wants to perform in our life. The goal is not to get rebuked. The goal is not to go in and, okay, I need to be rebuked, but, but sometimes sharpening takes friction, right? Just as we learned if you were at the sermon last week, Sharpening, uh, you know, in the process of sharpening something, it takes grinding and, and, and friction and, and heat. So sometimes the, the growth comes through that. Finally, apply it and, and update your mentor. Right? Do it. Do, try and practice the, the thing that was discussed with you. If it's something practical, try and do it. Sometimes it's not always something practical. Sometimes it's more of a concept or an idea that you need to meditate on. Right? I remember when um, I was being mentored in the UK, when I was single before I met my wife, I was talking to um, my, my mentor, he was an older married guy, and I was kind of talking to him about what should I be looking for in a girl, right? what kind of quality should I be looking for, because I was really confused, you know. Um, and I was getting close to this girl in church and, you know, you know, taking her out on a dates here and there, and he kind of felt like it wasn't right for me. He kind of, he kind of had concerns that my motivation wasn't right, wasn't pure. And so he, in a polite way, in a kind way, started bringing up this conversation about what actually should you be looking for in a girl. And one of the things he said that it stuck with me, I remember him saying this, and I thought it was a little bit extreme, but he said, you need to marry a woman who can raise your children to be future leaders in the kingdom. <laughs> if you know the guy, he's quite an extreme guy, you, you'd understand why he would say something like that. I'm I'm, by the way, I'm talking about what kind of girl should I date, right? And I'm like a 19-year-old, 20-year-old here, thinking about dating for the first time, okay? And this guy's like, you need to marry a woman who can raise your children to be leaders in the kingdom. And I was like, bro, whoa, whoa, chill. <laughs> We're talking about marriage and kids right now. <laughs> but, but it stuck with me because he was kind of telling me to begin with the end in mind, right? Begin with the end in mind. 
do you want to date someone just because you, you need security of dating someone and you just want to have fun? Or, or, or actually, are you here because you really want to begin with the end in mind? Can you see this person raising your children to be Christians and to be leaders? And honestly, it, it just, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't practice that advice. It's not something I could go and apply, but it's something I had to kind of marinate with and, and meditate on. And it just so happened that the girl I was close with ended up leaving the church. And the person that I did end up coming to, to know was Sonia, my wife, and I felt like she was the fulfillment of that advice and that prophecy. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, it, it was something that just stuck in the back of my head. Sometimes there's not always practicals that we get from mentorship, but there's ideas, there's convictions, there's things that get passed to us that we just need to marinate on. Update, update as well. How's it going? Finally, how to be a good enough mentor. And I'm gonna go through this one quite quickly. And again, there's not enough time to go deep into these things, but I want you to just get an overview of the principles. Um, if you're sitting here thinking, I'm not mature enough to be, mentor, be mentoring anyone, appreciate your humility, number one, um, because there might be some here thinking, I wanna mentor people, but they're not yet in the place where they can. So appreciate your humility, but I want you to know that God wants you to mentor someone. Amen. It may not be now, it may not be next year, but it should be in the coming years. Because every single Christian needs to be raising someone up. That's the biblical example that we just look at. Every single relationship in the Bible, there's someone raising up someone, someone being raised up by someone to go on and do great things. So if you're sitting here thinking, I don't want to mentor anyone, or I'm not ready to mentor yeah. anyone, get ready. Because if you want to walk this path with God, you are going to mentor someone. And it's not always going to be easy. But here are some principles to help you mentor someone. See them not as they are, but who they can be. Having Christ-like vision for someone. Sometimes when we mentor someone, we look at all of their wrongs and their mistakes. And we see everything that's wrong with them, rather than everything that could be right with them. And so our mentorship becomes about fixing their problems rather than nurturing what, they're actually, what they actually have, the raw material that's there. You know? Now in mentorship, especially Christian mentorship, we do need to address sin. We do need to address character issues. But the mentorship should not be defined by those things. The mentorship should be defined by what's your goal? Who, are you trying, who is God shaping you to become? And let me help you to get there. We need to, and in order to do that, we need to see people for who they can be, not who they are. And I'll give you one example, which I'm not going to read, but the example that always comes to my head, John chapter 4, the, the Samaritan woman at the well. This woman comes out to the well, who is someone that Jesus should not be talking to. She's an outcast. She's a sinful woman. Even Jesus' disciples are like, whoa, 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 get, get, get away from her. You know, Jesus goes, he comes to, he has a conversation with her, and he doesn't see her the way that the world sees her. In fact, when Jesus saw the Samaritan woman, he saw someone that could change her hometown. He saw an evangelist that will actually change people's lives. And he has this conversation with her. In one conversation, she completely turns and repents and becomes the savior of her hometown because she goes and she shares the gospel in Samaria. And it's just an incredible thing for, 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 to read, to see how Jesus does not see someone where they're at, but he sees where they can be. I think that's a principle we can apply. The second is we need to ask and listen, right? Um, we've had some discussions on this recently in Gem, but a good mentor, a good enough mentor is someone that doesn't make assumptions about someone, but asks a lot of questions first. Because sometimes we can end up sharing something to someone that they didn't ask for and they don't need, right? And that's not helpful. In order to know what I need to share, I need to ask questions. I need to understand who they are understand what their strengths are, understand what's getting in the way of them achieving their goals. And I need to be really good at listening too. Right? I need to really engage and listen and show the person that I've created a space where they can be heard. And one of the things that someone says is a good friend is a good listener. So in order to be a good friend and a good mentor, we have to be a good listener too. So ask and listen. Um, and then thirdly, once you understand them, and you've asked good questions and you've really listened, we need to actually share our lives to them in such a way that they feel inspired to also follow Christ. 
Another way of looking at this is when we share our lives, can they see the Bible coming to, coming to life? Right? You need to share your life with someone that inspires them. Someone who I think does this really well, there's an uncle called um, Joe. Uh, Om Joe, some of you know Om Joe. But when he shares his life, I've been studying the Bible with someone with him. And he asked me to lead the Bible because he doesn't like teaching people. So he's not, he says he's not good at like sharing the verses and teaching. So what he does is I share the verses and then he jumps in and shares his life. And it's so powerful. I was kind of observing this. I was like, this is an interesting dynamic here because he wants me to share the verse and then he wants to share how that verse became a reality in his life. And when you hear his story, it's just so crazy. Right? It's just so amazing the way that, how crazy his life w was how much has changed, the kind of people that he used to do to, to business with and be close with, the kind of things he used to do, and how his life has changed today. It's just amazing to see the Bible coming alive, uh, alive in his life. You can see his passion for God. You can see his journey with God. Each and every one of us, I believe, can do that. You can share your journey. You can share your mistakes. You can share what God has been doing in your life in a way that will bring the Bible alive. A good, a good enough mentor also knows how to do that. And finally, a good enough mentor doesn't just quit, doesn't just give up once the, once the, the time is done. The relationship, the friendship is ongoing. There's a follow-up, there's a consistency, there's a how are you doing? Anything that you've learned recently that I can be updated about or anything I can pray for you about. There's a follow-up from a good enough mentor. It's not a transactional relationship. This is a genuine relationship out of love. So Good Enough Mentor does these things, um, and that's what I want to close with tonight. I want to leave, leave you with this quote. What we do for ourselves dies with us. What we do for others lives on and is immortal. Yeah. How much are you yeah. storing up what's immortal right now in your life? Right? How much of your life right now is being sent on to immortality? Right? Another way Jesus puts this is storing up treasures in heaven. Yeah. Right? It's the same thing. How much of our life right now is, is, is investing in the immortal versus investing in ourselves? God knows the world needs it. God knows the church needs it. Can we do it? So I want us to just close with a couple of questions for you to think about. How easy or difficult is it for you to seek mentorship? And have you had any examples in your life where a relationship really sharpened you to be faithful to be uh, more the qualities that God wants to see in you. Something for your own reflection, uh, being a good enough mentee, being a good enough mentor, and ultimately being a good enough friend and having fruitful friendships because fruitful friendships are founded, I believe, on these biblical principles. So I hope this helps. I'm gonna close us up in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you God for your word for your wisdom through Proverbs um, that just helps us to, to see what, is, what it means to be a real friend, Father. Um, Lord, so, so often friendships can be just shallow, just based on hobbies, Father, but I really pray, Lord, that we can understand from your word what it takes of us to be a fruitful friend, Lord, to be able to seek mentorship, to seek the friendships that help us to grow, to seek to be sharpened, and also in turn to do that for others, God, to be willing to be ready to mentor in that way for others, God. We just pray, Lord, that we can see um, the church being sharpened, Father, to become who you want us to be for you so that we can love one another more fully, so that we can reflect um, you more, more fully, more perfectly, God, so that the world would know that you're our disciples, as the Bible says. Help us to be sharpened. Help us to sharpen one another. Uh, and we pray, Lord, for um, the church to reflect your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.